Welcome, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to a very special NYU Abu Dhabi 10th talk. My name is Yusuf Al Ateba, and I'm excited to be your host for a discussion about the origins, achievements, and more importantly, the future of NYU Abu Dhabi. The university is celebrating its 10 year anniversary this fall, and I don't think anyone could have anticipated the speed at which NYU Abu Dhabi would evolve into one of the world's top universities. When it was founded 10 years ago, it was an experiment that brought together some of the most visionary leaders in government and in education to create a truly global university. 10 years on, to say that the experiment is a success would be a profound understatement. Today, NYU Abu Dhabi attracts the best and brightest students from around the world. It has assembled a world-class faculty and it's transforming the arts landscape of Abu Dhabi in a way that no one has expected. This remarkable accomplishment is the result of hard work by many, many people, but really the leadership of three of our guests here today. Rima al Muqarrab chairs the Board of Tamkeen, an organization tasked with delivering projects that enrich Abu Dhabi's social, cultural, and educational landscape. She's also a member of the NYU Board of Trustees. John Sexton is President Emeritus of New York University and currently serves as CEO of the Catalyst Foundation for, for Universal Education, and he is the godfather of the idea of NYU Abu Dhabi. Marriott Westerman is the Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive of NYU Abu Dhabi. Marriott oversees all academic, administrative, and operational affairs at NYU Abu Dhabi, and also serves on the senior leadership team of NYU in New York. She is a very visible presence in the intellectual and cultural life of Abu Dhabi. Rima, John, Marriott, welcome to the 10th Talks, and thanks for being with us today. Rima, if I may, let me start with you. Tell us, what was Abu Dhabi's vision for a new university, and how come NYU was the best partner, and how did that selection come about? Well, first, thank you, Yusuf, John, Marriott. It's wonderful to be here with you all. As we're celebrating NYU AD's 10th anniversary, it's just remarkable to reflect on what this partnership has achieved for Abu Dhabi, for NYU, and globally. So let me zoom out for a second. Abu Dhabi and New York are two of the most globalized cities in the world. We're crossroads cities. The whole world travels with us and through us. So because of this, our experiences as well as our challenges don't stay neatly within our borders. So we asked ourselves, how do you educate students for that world? How do you engage with ideas and creativity happening outside of your home country? And one of the things that made NYU the perfect partner was that they were asking the same questions at about the same time, and we were all coming to some very similar conclusions. So for our part in Abu Dhabi, we wanted to create an institution that reflected its environment and all the exciting energy and ideas coming out of UAE. And we wanted a place that would allow the world to engage with the Arab Muslim Middle East deeply with all the richness that that brings, but not to stop there, to also look outward. And of course, we were resolutely focused on academic excellence. But beyond that, we hope to nurture a creative, outward-oriented community that feels a responsibility, not just to one place or one city, but to the world and to the natural environment that we live in. So this new kind of institution, it had to develop in its students a facility and a comfort with connection. I mean, both the act of human connection, but also the technology that supports it. And to do that, the institution also had to embody this openness and this engagement where your first instinct is to see our common humanity and to seek to understand each other, not to convert. And where you disagree, how do you do that constructively and not destructively? And that ethos had to flow through everything, from the curriculum to the student body to the research agenda. That represented the future-facing model of higher education. So 
I'm unendingly grateful and thank goodness we all came together and made it our mission to bring NYUAD to life. Thank you, Rima. John, I have a similar question for you. You've had this idea uh, well before the 10 years that the university has been operational. How did you and NYU decide on coming to Abu Dhabi or what made Abu Dhabi attractive for you? It's very interesting to reflect on this, especially in the company of the three of you, because uh, each of the three of you have been key components to this, really from the very, very beginning, or at least very close to the very, very beginning of this. You and I, for example, met at the very beginning, Yusuf, uh, and Marriott and Rima were very quickly involved in the dream. Uh, but uh, roll back the clock from, from, from that first meeting that I had with uh, one of the great people I've ever met, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, a real incarnation of, in my view, Plato's philosopher king. Uh, roll back from that 2006 meeting uh, to, to uh, May 2001, when I, as dean of the law school, was asked to move over to be president of New York University. And I, actually, I, I, I was reluctant to do it, but, but, but it turned out I brought two assets that were important and connect to this story directly. The first is this accent, which is an unadorned, uncompromising Brooklyn accent. In other words, I knew the streets of New York City. I knew New York City and loved New York City uh, in, in its essence, the kind of place that Rima has just described. And the, the second was I, I, I had been schooled and trained in my DNA by my parents, uh, by the Jesuits who educated me, uh, that if you were blessed, as the four of us had been blessed, uh, with, with something we didn't earn, and, and that is just being born smart and being smart, born smart in a context where being smart made a difference, where, where, where you could develop that. You know? and, and, you know, I'd been given that and I was taught by my parents and, 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 and by the Jesuits that if you do that, you have to live a useful life. You have to use that gift well. Uh, so I, as I moved over to be president of NYU with this deep connection to New York City, I was searching for a way in which NYU could be different in the world. And I noticed something about New York City. Uh, New York City was the first city in the world to have a neighborhood for every country in the world, populated by people who were born in that country. And, and, and those uh, neighborhoods, the 200 or so neighborhoods, uh, came together. But if you went into those neighborhoods, even though you would hear the prayers or the music or the language or taste the food of the country, if you ask the people uh, how they identified, they would say, I'm a New Yorker. So there was this this kind of connectivity that Rima has spoken about, you know, in a whole that was greater than some of the parts. It was the world's first, what I called at the time, global, global and local simultaneous city. And that extrapolated a vision for NYU, which is unique in that it has no campus. You know, you walk out of NYU buildings, you step on sidewalk and they're not next to each other. And there's no quadrangle, and uh, at least not one we own in Washington Square Park. Some people would say it's a quadrangle for us, but it's not. Uh, and and so, so this interconnectivity, uh, I called it because of my background in the history of religion, this ecumenism, but not a theological ecumenism, a secular ecumenism, became a, a, a an aspiration for NYU. And that led us to extrapolate out this notion of a global network university that would be, be, be a connecting with the world from those neighborhoods. And, and we began to create study of waste sites. And, and as we did it, we very quickly knew not to be Eurocentric. So we had Accra, we, 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 we had Shanghai, and we had Buenos Aires. But what was obviously missing was the presence of the great culture of the Arab and Muslim world. And then the question became, was it possible to be in that world? And, and, and 
Um, could we do it? Could, could, could we mobilize our community to do it? And we began to investigate possibilities. And at this point, I asked Marriott to be my, my uh, Beatrice in this. Uh, and uh, she, she, uh, we began to investigate. We looked at six places, but every single person I talked to from all different kinds of vantage points, from, from high finance to government to religion, citizens of the world, men, women, uh, said to me again and again, there is this unique place with unique leadership that although it's tiny geographically, uh, has a vision for the world of a united world. And, and it was at that point that a person that knew both of us sa said, you must meet Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. And, and that fateful first meeting in the Majlis uh, occurred. It was supposed to be 15 minutes. Uh, I got a call uh, in the shower because in the Emirates Palace, they have phones in the shower. A kid from Brooklyn never even thought that was possible. Uh, but I answered the phone and they said the meeting had been moved up. I had to be in the car in 15 minutes. I dashed out for this 15 minute meeting. I was warned as I went into the meeting do not even shake his highness's hand unless he offers it to you. And certainly do not hug him. Do not <laughs> hug him. And uh, there, there, there I was walking into this environment where I never dreamt as a child I ever could be. And I met this man and a 15 minute meeting became an hour and 15 minutes. And in that meeting, he said to me, would it be possible to create here a university that would make Abu Dhabi, one of the great idea capitals of the world. And could we do that and have here a full university, a research university, much more than a study away site, which was the kind of thing we had been doing. And could we do that at the highest level? And I said, well, no one's ever tried to do it, especially in a short time, but, uh, you're talking about my dream. Are you kidding? Are you talking about my dream? So he said, well, what are you most worried about? And I said, I'm, I'm worried that either I or you would compromise the excellence agenda. If we're going to do this, we really should do it at the highest level of academic quality and excellence and open it to, to the talented of the world, faculty, students, and others. So I'm afraid that I'd send over an A-minus faculty member instead of A-plus, or we, we, we'd admit an A-minus student instead of an A-plus. And you might say to me, cut a corner here, cut a corner there, and nobody will notice. People will notice. People will notice. We're trying to do this. We have to overshoot it first and then calibrate back. to, to, to. We're doing something that's going to be uh, sui generis. It's going to be one-off. And he said, well, I'd like to make Abu Dhabi the center not only for elevating the education of my people, but educating the leaders of the world. It's united. And I said, well, if, if you'll try, I'll try. And he said, we won't let each other down. As we walked out to the car, uh, just before I got in the car, I said, sir, this is a dream come true. We'll make it happen. And he looked at me. I remember. I think you were there, Yusuf, and, and, and he said, uh, where's my hug? <laughs> and we gave each other a hug. We've hugged every time, each time we've met, each time we've met since. And I, I'll say publicly, I, I say to him, I love you. Uh, he says the same to me. And we each say to each other, each time we meet, we have each exceeded uh, the other's expectation. So it was a kernel of an idea that he took and amplified and, and nurtured through thick and thin, through surprises about how much it took, uh, never, never did he compromise. And the key, I say again and again to people around the world, publicly, privately, the key was we were fortunate enough to have the right partners. And the, 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 the place that you represent, and Rima incarnates, and Marion and I have come to love uh, was was key to this because of its unique commitment to the values that Reamer expressed. 
it's, it's really an amazing story. Um, Rima, I'm going to go back to you. So we've heard from both John and from you about the vision. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the journey. How did it go from this vision that you and John mentioned into the functioning reality of what it is today? Well, having a shared vision, of course, is an important foundation, but it's not enough. Imagining, then building a new university from the ground up, that's an incredibly complex and challenging task. And the mandate was deceptively simple for our part. It was get it done. But the second part of our mandate was not so simple which is get it done in our lifetime, not in 200 years. So of the thousands of moving parts that had to come together to do that, I'm going to try to distill it down to five, let's call it critical ingredients as to how that happens. And the first, you know, is what John said, and I can't stress it enough, is that nothing works without a deep and real partnership built on a shared mission and on commitment. It just cannot work if somebody blinks. The second ingredient is that, what if no one came? We needed to find these pioneering, creative students and faculty and staff who believed in the value of what we were doing, who were ready to build it with us, and who would jump with us, who would take a leap of faith. And I might add, betting their educational and professional future <laughs> that this could happen. So that's no small thing. Um, the third core ingredient, I'd say, is that NYUAD has in its center three founding identities. An Emirati one, an American one, and a global one. And we wanted and actually had to build a partnership that showed that those three things could live together harmoniously and enrich each other and not conflict and together do good for the world. And so giving authentic life to those three identities, I'd say helped shape decision-making across all areas of the institution, from the curriculum to the campus design. And it's so clear in this very unique and textured culture that you can experience when you're on campus. And it's really very special and so authentic to our partnership and something I'm incredibly proud of uh, for the institution. Uh, the next ingredient I'd say sort of follows from the last one, and that's that NYUAD had to be in and of Abu Dhabi, not a copy paste of New York, not a foreign import, and certainly not somehow set apart or removed. It actually had to be part of the fabric of the city or it wouldn't work and it wouldn't be real. And that sort of brings me to the final, the fifth critical element. And that was we had to find a way to provide for the movement of people and ideas. You can't really prepare students for a more connected, more complex and challenging world in theory. That learning has to be lived in its own context all over the world, not just in one place, not just in a classroom, and it's going to look and feel different in each environment. And that's why we shifted the traditional model of higher education, which is that study abroad was rare and it's available just to a minority of students, and pioneered the NYUAD model, which requires universal study abroad, usually in more than one country, and it's part of this hyper-globalized curriculum supported by a tech platform. And that was the, the new, unique sort of experiment. And so a shared vision without all of those core ingredients doesn't get you very far. John, you've said this repeatedly. Uh, NYU Abu Dhabi has exceeded your expectations. But tell us a little bit of what you think NYU Abu Dhabi has brought to higher education as a model. I mean, how has it helped higher education? How has it redefined what an elite institution should be? So, so higher education is uh, a very complex 
uh, organism, and we should never forget that. Uh, uh, in the United States, for example, there are 5,000 colleges, community colleges, and research universities. Uh, so we're talking about a certain part of the orchestra, the symphony orchestra of higher education, especially when we bring it back and look at the world. Uh, when we talk about the, the domain in which NYU Abu Dhabi operates, and it's, it's, uh, it's the 200 to 500 leading universities in the world, you know, that we're talking about. And uh, I think it's fair to say, and you can tell this, by the way, uh, even as I, I, I've, been, I've been off the scene, so to speak, since January 2016, but uh, uh, you never know that from my inbox or, or, or from the invitations I get uh, to, to speak about NYU Abu Dhabi and the global network and the concept, uh, because they, 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 whereas 20 years ago, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the dominant ethos of the, the 100 or 200 leading universities in the world was, as, as one of my colleagues who was one of the first faculty members at NYU Abu Dhabi put it, Stephen Holmes, he said to me, yeah, in, until this moment when this university was created, the, even the greatest universities in the world had as their purpose educating the national elite, educating the leaders of the nation. This is the first university in the world that does both that, but also sees as its purpose educating an integrated, mutually cooperative uh, leadership for the world. I, I mean, think of what NYU Abu Dhabi does at, at producing four or 500 graduates a year from, uh, you know, uh, anywhere from 75 to 125 countries a year, all of whom have enjoyed the formative years of their lives in an ecumenical context, where a cosmopolitan context, where in a cosmopolitan city that they come to love for its cosmopolitanism. And they not only connect to that city through their classmates and friends who are Emirati and have those relationships for life, but they then go out into the world. We're pumping out four or 500 students with this, this, this ethos every year. You do that for 20 years, and all of a sudden, 25 years from now, people are going to look around and say, why are all these people leading these institutions, public, private, corporate, governmental, why are they getting along? Oh, they all lived in the same dorm on Savvy Island, you know? <laughs> and it's, so uh, the, 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 this was a game changer for the definite. You cannot go on a college tour or a video tour of a leading university anywhere in the world anymore without them claiming to be global in perspective. They may or may not be doing it. Okay, and there's no one on an Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi scale of 100 that, uh, that, 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 that penetrates into the 70s, let alone the 80s or 90s. Okay, but uh, uh, everybody's claiming it because it's become, it's become obvious. I mean, reduce it to its most basic. Thought is not confined by geographical boundaries and sin. You know, they, 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 thoughts always been global, global, global and local simultaneous. And, and essentially, this was the university. So Jared Cohn, the former uh, president of a great university, Carnegie Mellon, a person respected by everyone, when he came to do the 10-year review of New York University writ large, uh, took me aside, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind my saying this publicly, but he took this aside, he said it to our trustees. He said, somewhere at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a group of people sat in the old established, hundreds of years old universities of uh, Europe and said, what are these Americans doing by combining uh, research with undergraduate education in this thing they're calling the research university? You know, and, it, and sure enough, by the end of the century, everybody was emulating. And he said, you know what, John, 50 years from now, people are going to be saying, 
why were we having this conversation back then? You know, what is NYU Abu Dhabi doing? What is the global of that working? But it's a, it's been a game changer in terms of the norms of higher education. I, 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 I mean, I know I'm not objective about that, but I can tell you that's what I'm told as uh, twice a week I lecture here, there, or wherever uh, 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 about the nature of what's happened. Everybody wants to know what's happened. Marriott, uh, sorry to keep you waiting. I'm going to come to you now. And you are the one running this amazing institution. Could you tell us a little bit about the highlights, the opportunities, the challenges? What, what is running what is essentially an experiment that has never been done before really like? Thank you so much, Yusuf. And really, I want to say how moving and wonderful it is to be with you and with Rima and with John. And to realize that on our 10th anniversary, among the four of us, uh, we have some 45 years or more actually of thinking, working, visioning, and creating NWA Abu Dhabi. And indeed, to what um, John and Rima both have said, there has been no blinking in the partnership, no blinking on the quality. And that's really what makes uh, being now in this incredible position to be able to lead this institution with this whole community behind it and around it, so wonderful. So I could uh, talk about many highlights, but let me give you just a few of, few thoughts here. As you've heard already, and we have this vision, you can condense it by saying, I think, that it is to be an engine for learning beyond borders towards a better world. The world has borders, we can't get around them, but we can go beyond them and stretch in our learning, our inquiry, our teaching. And our strength is also uh, that we are indeed both local and global. We are very much a grounded anchor institution of Abu Dhabi in a modern Arab country, the UAE. And along with that, we're a really strong university on the world stage that is fueled by the capacities of this major global research university that NYU has become over the last 30 years, you could say. And I think that really, that special condition and that vision really is what drive um, really the fact that this is the opportunity of a lifetime leading such a transformative institution. And I also wanna say it's just a daily source of joy, uh, particularly to do it in Abu Dhabi city, which is a city I was very delighted to return to two years ago. And that is just very meaningful to my family and to me. But let me say a little bit more about what Emwe Abu Dhabi is today, because that's really what I've come back after all this time now to run. And I think the thing to say is that um, the first vice chancellor, Al Bloom, the first provost, Fabio Piano, who worked with, with NYU, with everyone in Abu Dhabi in the partnership, really have delivered on that vision, which makes it that much easier to run today. Because what we found in the past, 13 years really, is that our vision is indeed exceedingly appealing for accomplished and ambitious faculty and students who could be at any of the world's greatest universities. That's what not blinking means. But it's not easy really to attract such talent. Why do they come here? I think they come here for that vision and because we make it possible. And they come here from the UAE, uh, almost 20% of our students is from the UAE, and the rest come from around the world. Uh, you've already heard it, about 120 countries. Uh, our faculty come from about 45, and they come here, I would say, because they don't only want to do well, they want to do good. It's fine to want to do well for yourself, your family, your city, and so forth, but our faculty and students also really want to put something new in the world that helps make it a better place in various dimensions. Now, I always thought like John that we could find these students that we wanted because there are many students who need uh, educate, good education in the world. Um, talent is distributed isometrically around the world. The opportunity to develop it is not. And since we are really an equity oriented institution, we help students come here uh, in many different ways and we give them opportunities they wouldn't have had at home. So I knew we would get great students and we really do get these incredibly motivated and interesting students. Um, faculty, of course, you might say is harder because uh, they're more specialized. 
Uh, there's enormous competition for talent. Uh, it, it, it is harder, but it is incredible to see how we really have been able to attract faculty who are attracted precisely because, as John has said, they not only want to do great research and we make that possible for them because uh, our partnership and the uh, and Abu Dhabi, our Abu Dhabi government partner, is deeply interested in creating stronger research culture in the UAE. So we can help them bring their best research, but we also select our faculty for wanting to teach and wanting to be with these incredibly ambitious, interesting, diverse, and motivated students. And we really have managed to do that. So leading such an institution, when you are, as I am myself, both a researcher and a teacher, is really a daily joy. Um, so, so that's something about the great joys of the work. You really see uh, students come here and faculty who, what they bring into Emu Abu Dhabi is of course, what they've seen around the world. And that is many of the world's problems. And so they come here motivated to work together to tackle them beyond borders, whether it's climate change, economic inequality, or racial injustice. But they also, and I think this is important, shine a bright light on the beauty and the power in their own or each other's cultures. It's not all gloom and doom all the time. They share literature, film, art, sports, technology, inventions that come from their own cultures together. They share each other's rituals. We have a joke that you that we could celebrate New Year every month at MW Abu Dhabi, and we pretty much do because it comes from all these different cultures. So it is an incredible experience really to lead a university with that kind of motivated and creative and hardworking community of such incredible diversity of interest, background, countries of origin, ethnicity, religion, all kinds of interests. And then I would say, along with that, uh, of course, leading and supporting such a community of such a wide variety of personal, cultural, and linguistic experiences is not always a simple matter. There are difficult days too. But I think we are a robust institution that can tackle some of those challenges. Um, there are differences of views, of course, and sometimes they rub up against each other. So this is where academic institutions have a built-in potential that MW Abu Dhabi has really developed very well. You have to create venues and opportunities for vigorous discourse, for disagreement, as Rima has said, but you have to ensure as a leader and as a community that those kinds of conversations and debates are gonna be grounded in mutual respect, in truth seeking, fact finding, empathy and solidarity. And I do think that our students, our staff, our professors all understand this. But sometimes of course, we do have to keep reminding ourselves of the ground rules of free academic discourse and everyone's right of speaking. And uh, I'm just very proud of how our community has been able to do that and especially how it has helped us uh, come through uh, the current, the various stages we've had of the pandemic so far. Really, I want to say intact and as a whole empathetic and adaptable uh, community. Mary, you know based on everything we've heard, the, the demographics, the diversity, the student population, the location of Abu Dhabi is, is this unique, unconventional arrangement. How have you seen that? How have the graduates taken that and translated it into their careers, their post NYU Abu Dhabi life? Our students, as I've mentioned, really do figure out while they're here, they don't know it when they come precisely, but while they're here, we support them to figure out what it means, what I said, to do well and also to do good. And so we have the metrics we can point to, and it is extremely joyous to recite them. Uh, we have the 16 road scholars uh, among 1600 graduates. Uh, that's of course more per capita than any university in the world. We have the Fulbright scholars, the Yenching scholars, the Schwarzmans, the Erasmus Mundus scholars, all the most important fellowships in the world for graduate study and special opportunities have come to our students from all these different countries. They take them, they go out into the world. Sometimes they go back to their home countries, 
Sometimes they go to other countries that they've gotten to know through their uh, study abroad in all these different sites that we support on six continents. Many times also they come back to the UAE. I want to say that those wonderful awards that we uh, mention, and we have many every year, are only the beginning. And of course, I look at what all our graduates are doing, not only the ones who are representative with these fantastic uh, scholarships. It's what they do after they come back with from their next step that you need to look at, I think. And here I'm very happy to say that all of our students from all these countries um, find, almost all find very meaningful employment, some 61% of them, or graduate education, almost 30%. And then a few start to do entrepreneurial things. And so um, within a few months of graduating, most of them have those opportunities queued up even during COVID-19 at the moment of graduation. 95% or more get there very quickly. 60% of our students who are employed soon after graduation work in the UAE. That is many, many, many students who didn't grow up here, although quite a few, of course, did grow up here and are Emirati. But many of them were so attracted to this country, having never lived here before, being very grateful for the education they got, and they got to love it. They became interested in this cosmopolitan place, and they strive to work here in all these different industries, uh, tech, investment, um, social services, uh, philanthropy the arts, uh, the burgeoning creative industries uh, uh, system, consulting, banking. And beyond, of course, we find similar spread uh, across the world. I think it's important to mention a few of their individual journeys because they really matter. At this rate, uh, we still are a relatively small institution, although 500 or so students now come into the um, world every year for an undergraduate program. You, we, we still know what all of them do and we keep track of it. Of course, one of our prides and joys is um, the trajectory of Shama al Masrui, who was one of, uh, in our first class of 2014, became a Rhodes Scholar, studied political economy and came back to become, at the time, the very youthful Minister of State for Youth. And today she's still the Minister of State for Youth Affairs. Um, we've had extraordinary entrepreneurs who found each other, who work together. For example, uh, two of our students, two women who created our We STEM Society while here to promote the role of women in STEM. Uh, many women join, men join as well to promote uh, the, their presence in STEM. And they took that entrepreneurial spirit beyond their graduation and created a company called Imagi Labs that started, uh, that helps uh, girls learn how to code and want to be interested uh, in the tech industries. We've had students from five different countries create a global arts collective, Tooth and Fang, that's winning prizes. One of our talented Nepali engineering students has won prizes, including the Shazayat Prize for sustainability, for creating sustainable schools and building them in his home country of Nepal. It goes on and on. I could give you so many of these journeys. And of course, these are very high profile, but we follow all of our students. And I want to say that I am just as moved by a student who was in one of my very first classes when I uh, taught here um, in, in 2011, who quietly worked away and eventually went back to his home state in a, you know, a rather challenged state in the Rust Belt of um, America and has become a doctor uh, supporting reproductive health and women who don't have access to reproductive health services in his, in his home state. So I think you see that uh, creative energy, that empathy, and that care for creating a better world than the one they've inherited at whatever scale uh, motivates so much of these journeys of our students. Thank you, Marion. Uh, Rima, our last question goes to you. I'll try to make it an easy one. We've heard all these amazing stories of these amazing students and what they've done with their lives and how they've contributed to societies beyond NYU. But I wanna take the question in the other direction. Tell me a little bit about how NYU has enriched Abu Dhabi 
what are the contributions that NYU Abu Dhabi has provided and made Abu Dhabi a richer, uh, more cosmopolitan society just by the virtue of, of the program and the students? Well, Yusuf, it's not easy keeping that one short, but I will try. Um, well, the contributions are enormous and everyone said it, I'll say it again, so much greater than we could have imagined or even hoped at this stage. So let me try to distill it to a few areas. I'll start with research. Um, here in Abu Dhabi, faculty have pioneered cutting edge research. They're studying the causes of heart disease and diabetes in UAE. They're using the Arabian Gulf as a natural lab to study coral reef conservation. They're developing new techniques to process clean drinking water and preserving UAE's mangroves. They're also analyzing data from UAE's HOPE mission to Mars to better understand Mars's weather and then share that with the rest of the world. And that's just academia. If we then shift from research to NYUAD's impact on the community and the cultural landscape, you have the Performing Arts Center and the Art Gallery which are now local hubs for the arts. They've attracted more than 90,000 attendees to their performances and to their exhibitions, which are just wonderful. And the Institute has presented something like 700 public lectures by local and global thought leaders in every field over the years. And if we shift sort of from community to the entrepreneurial side that Mariette mentioned and described so beautifully, that our incubator, Start AD, has raised something like $70 million in investment and created over 300 jobs. And I have to add, NYUAD played a critical role in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to name a few of their contributions, they developed innovative testing methods. They created 3D printed masks for our frontline workers in healthcare. And a number of the biology students were emergency volunteers in our PCR testing labs during the most challenging period of the crisis. And that's just the Abu Dhabi impact and just a small portion of it. But I'd like to add and you know, even add to your question, if you shift back to New York, NYUAD has had an enormous impact back there as well. You know, it should be seen as one of the critical engines of NYU's ever-growing success as a global university. It was the first portal campus that brought you fully into the NYU system from outside of New York. It was that proof of concept, you know, the first mover in the global network university. And NYUAD has allowed New York and students and faculty to engage deeply in the Middle East in a way that was not previously possible. So I'm enormously proud of this community, which is growing each year. And as hundreds of graduates enter the workforce around the world, they're catalyzing immediate and positive change. Their contributions, and I'm not exaggerating, will be transformative wherever they go. And this is just the start I think it's fair to say that the best is yet to come. Thank you, Rima. Thank you, Marriott. Thank you, John. And a special, special thank you and congratulations to all three of you. Everybody who has been a part of this incredible journey that went from an idea in John's mind into the functioning reality today that has easily exceeded everybody's expectation. Thank you for your commitment to excellence. Thank you for your commitment to diversity. Thank you for your commitment to make sure we don't cut corners because the result has been truly incredible. And uh, for me personally, as someone who was there in that first meeting between John and Sheikh Mohammed, I never ever would have imagined it being what it is today. And I only hope that more people are aware of the things that we talked about today. I hope more people are actually informed about what we've managed to accomplish. And I think that's gonna come down to the students for them to speak about their experiences. 
but I really want everyone to know how proud we are of what we collectively accomplished together. Thank you all for being with me today and happy 10th anniversary to everybody. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf.